When I was where you're sitting right now, I couldn't even spell the word entrepreneur. The entrepreneurism was not on my mind. In fact, uh, this was my final, this was one of my final projects, because I was a senior here, translate some of the Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah into English. So um, that's kind of where my mind was when I was here where you're sitting right now. And did I know what I was going to do with that in my life? No. I had no idea. I hadn't really thought that one through other than I just kind of liked it. I actually tried to be a seminary teacher. I went through the program here at BYU and they didn't want me. So I had to figure out something else to do with my life. And so I left BYU and I actually ended up, not really by design, but ended up starting a couple of companies. I was interested in digital video production at the time. and. I, w I actually worked for Apple Computer when I was a student here at BYU. I was the guy who went around to all the departments and tried to convince them to switch over from the PC to Apple, which if you know anything about 1990s, that was like an impossible task. So uh, I started this little video production company and spent all my savings on video equipment. I bought 64 megabytes worth of RAM for $4,000. I, uh, yeah, 64 megabytes, not, not gigabytes. I, uh, I bought a, a two and a half gigabyte hard drive for another $2,000. And then I had to reprogram it so it would be fast enough. So I got into that and ended up uh, working for a company in Orem who bought all my equipment. One day I realized, you know, I, I'm killing myself trying to make my boss successful. And he's a terrible boss. And he's terrible at running companies. And he's going to kill this company single-handedly. And I can do at least that bad on my own. So I left. And in the meantime, I had gotten into the internet. And the internet was all brand new back then. And nobody knew anything about it. And I was the marketing guy for this software company. And, and when I was in college here, I also did some graphic design and some stuff like that. So, Sort of, sort of a creative type. And I, I thought, as this marketing guy, you know, our company probably needs to have a website. And nobody knew anything about it. So I jumped in, and I didn't know the difference between FTP and Telnet. I didn't know anything. And just started learning and teaching myself and, and reading and practicing and playing around. And I loved it. And it was so exciting. And I ended up making a, a website, and I ended up being one of the, bringing in one of the very first data <laughs> T1s into Orem to use for a website. And I set up a free internet service for all of the employees in this company. And I learned how to write some software, and I wrote some shopping cart software. I did all these things that I, I really enjoyed. So I, I left, and I started a company that was like Groupon meets student services. And then it was called College Days. And it was all for college students. It was like a social network where you get daily deals and stuff like that. And you guys know all about daily deals because half the businesses we see from students have in some way, shape, or form have to do with how do you get stuff for free or for cheap? Because that's where we are as students. So that didn't go anywhere. In fact, it was just really hard. Nobody got it, but what they did get was websites. So I started this agency called Gravity Media, and what we were all about was creating web applications and web presences for marketing organizations of larger companies. And we got in and worked pretty close with uh, some interesting companies and, and did some good solutions, and Gravity succeeded and started to grow. And we got to the point that we had about 25 employees with Gravity Media. And I really wanted to know who's doing what, how much more can they do, what work are we doing that is good work, what work are we doing that's bad work that we're always losing money on. And how come whenever a customer wants to know where we are with a project, do they call me and ask me, we're a web company for crying out loud. Can't we answer this question in a different way than a telephone? And it was just really bugging me that we just had all these unknowns about the business. 
So I started writing some software on my nights and weekends. And that turned into quite a project, actually. It took me about a year, maybe a little more than a year. And so I would come home and tuck the little kitty hose in bed. And then I would go and write software till all hours of the morning and, and then get back to my job in the daytime. And I rolled that out to our customers with the agency. And they said, hey, this is pretty cool software. We can see exactly what you're doing for us. And we can tell where it is. And, and our approvals, instead of sending in email, we can just put them right here on, on the documents and, and in the projects you're doing for us. And so we captured all the great communication and didn't get lost. And, and to me, that looked like an opportunity. And it looked like enough of an opportunity that I decided to trade in all my equity on the agent, in the agency that I helped start and walk away from it in exchange for the IP of AtTask that I had been working on. And so that's where AtTask was born. That was in 2001. And I didn't take a paycheck for another 18 months after that because AtTask wasn't making any money. In fact, I borrowed money against my house so that I could pay employees uh, to come and help me out with that. And I also put money on credit cards and and uh, it was some real interesting times there with, with that task. Needless to say, I had three little kids at home. Um, my wife was super supportive. I never once came home and had her say, when are you going to get a real job before you end up in jail for not being able to pay all your debts and everything? And uh, so I, I worked at that task as the CEO until just recently, when I hired a CEO to be the CEO at AtTask, and now I'm just the, I'm chairman of the board, and so that doesn't take a lot of time for me. And, and uh, it's a real interesting thing that you go through in life when what you've been doing, 110%, you make yourself obsolete. You're like, there are better people to do that. And so then you're back in this, this stage where you're, asking yourself what you want to be when you grow up. And so I've been um, kind of back where I was when I was here at BYU for a little while, trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. But I love technology. And I, I, I discovered what I really love is, is uh, creating things. But my best company, I just want to put this plug in here, in spite of all the work and everything in, in technology, is my family, and that's my top priority. And this is my, uh, my recent family photo. My son just got a mission call to Taiwan, and we're all really proud of him and happy about that. And we learned over the weekend from Elder Cook that our top priority needs to be, first and foremost, in protecting time for our family. And it's really easy to get sucked into whatever you do. And it's really easy to have a thousand priorities and a thousand goals and things that are all good but not best. So um, I'll just let this hang on a second. I'll just let this play if we can hear it. So somebody asked Steve Jobs once what advice he would give to entrepreneurs. And this is what he said. Why is that not playing? I've got another video after that. All right. Fine. We'll just leave it there for a second. That's obviously not going to play for who knows why. But Steve Jobs said that the most important thing is passion for what you're doing. And the reason that passion is the most important is because when you're starting a company, it's hard. There are a lot of problems you've got to solve. It's not going to be easy. You know, here at BYU, we try and teach you some things and some tools so that it doesn't have to be so hard. We talk about lean startup and the best way to start companies and, and how to, how to kind of have a better understanding of the pain and the solution before you actually go out and go in 110%. But even still, behind every business, there needs to be somebody there who's pushing for an extended period of time, when, it's, when nobody cares, when it's not exciting, when you're not winning, when you're irrelevant, and yet you believe in it. 
and you're still willing to give it your all. And I really believe that. I think that passion is one of the most important things that entrepreneurs have, and you guys, as future entrepreneurs, the biggest key is to do something that you love so much that it wakes you up in the middle of the night, because you just can't wait to get going on it. So for me, I try to figure out, you know, what, did it, what, what do I really love? And I started a few companies, and I had this last year to kind of think about it, and I have to say, I really, I love technology, and that's, I wanted to just put this in your head but we can't hear it. But you all know the song, right? This is Kip and singing, I love technology. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna skip that since we can't hear it. So what's more than just technology is I found that I really love clearing the path for people to be effective in the workplace. Like it drove me nuts that people would have to be inefficient, waste their time, spin their wheels. You know, we're required to spend a lot of our time at work. And that's fine, it's a necessary part of life, but what just really eats at me is if that time doesn't count for something. And that, in and of itself, wakes me up at night. I really care about it. And so at test became this work of, we gotta make our time count for something in the workplace. We gotta work together efficiently and effectively. And we don't want people spinning their wheels on irrelevant tasks and, and uh, doing the wrong work the wrong way and then finding out later it was wrong and doing it again. We, re we really want our effort to count for something. And so AdTask is all about getting people to work together effectively. And I'm working on starting another company. It's called Motivosity. I'll, maybe I'll, when do we end, Steve? Okay. So maybe we'll have time to talk about that a little bit. But uh, Motivosity is all about how do we make the workplace now a good place for workers to be since our work life is just such a major part of our life. How is it that we can actually enjoy that and have it not be as necessary, you know, evil in our, in our lives? So everybody here is wired a little bit differently. Everybody cares about something different. Uh, we're, we're wired to drive different kinds of ideas forward. And that's really good. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, there's that video again, but I'm gonna skip it. So, uh, I noticed this when I was at, at Gravity Media and I just really you know, wanted to do something to fix the agency and I, I found this out at ATTAS too. And so we, we had some really crazy hard experiences that that, that that passion was able to help carry me through. You know, there were times where Literally, I sat around the table with my employees and asked them, okay, how much do you need so they don't turn your lights off? You know, how much, how much do you need to, to buy food or, or, you know, you're back, you're behind on your house payment because we just didn't have any money. We're just trying to stay alive and we're doing stuff like, uh, you know, I remember one customer that, that called us and and said, hey, IBM's been out here for a week trying to show their solution. And Microsoft came out for a week and they're trying to show their solution. And, you know, you guys are, are we've, we've talked to you a little bit. We don't really know a lot about AtTask. There was four of us then. So four of us versus what IBM or Microsoft had to offer. And they said, can you do this? I said, of course we can do that. Can you do this? Yes, of course we can do that. We do it. How, do you, how, how is it that you want this to happen? Oh, that's exactly how we do this. You know, and totally said yes to several things that we didn't do. And uh, um, they said, great, come out here and show us. And so I literally got on the plane, wrote code on the plane, wrote code in the hotel room all night long, called some of the guys, back in the office to help finish up a few things, showed up there, showed them what we were talking about, left with a contract that kept our company alive. Uh, it was stuff like that that, while, while difficult, was also just super fun at the time. And so Atas has grown up from this little four-person company shenaniganizing its way into large deals 
to a really legitimate company now. We've got customers in 80 different countries. We've got 350 employees. We have an office in Armenia. We have an office in London. We've, uh, you know, the product is available in 12 languages. We're helping hundreds of thousands of people be effective in their workplaces. We're helping companies save massive amounts of time. We're, say, we're helping companies be 20 to 30 percent more productive. We're cutting down on email traffic, sometimes by as much as 50 percent within large Fortune 500 companies. So companies like Apple and Cisco and Google and, and uh, uh, other well-known companies that you know of are using AtTask. And it's been a great success and it's been a lot of fun for me to be able to grow that company and, and learn some lessons along the way. And one thing I would ask you to think about is what is it that you really care about? You know, what, are, what difference do you want to make in the world? Because all of us is something different. And it took me a long time to figure out what it is I really love and care about. But one thing I've noticed, and that is students. There are some things they care about right now. Okay? And this is your life. Where do I get stuff for cheap? Where do I get free books? Where, where do I, you know, how do I manage my groceries so I don't waste food? Or, or where do I get better groceries for cheaper? Oh, and where do I meet people? Is that pretty much your life? at least from a lot of the student ideas and business ideas, they kind of fall in this, where do I meet people? Where do I get stuff for cheap? How do I save a dollar here or there? You know, um, how do I crowdsource my haircut? Whatever it is. So <clears throat> that would be an interesting haircut, wouldn't it? So my advice would be to go get a, go get a job as a future entrepreneur. Because you're going to be exposed to problems and circumstances that maybe you wouldn't ordinarily have been able to have insight into. So you're going to go be off in the medical profession or legal or whatever. And you can look around where you are and, and try to understand what are the problems that people are grappling with. And try to understand what is it that you really care about, what drives you. And another little bit of advice. When you do go get that job, live simply. I always had this, mod this mantra that I live by. It drove my wife nuts, which was go work, earn some money, then put the money in the bank and pretend that you don't have any. And at the time in the agency, when the agency was going well, you know, I had friends that were buying new houses and new cars and I was still driving this lousy 19, I don't know, 1988 Toyota Corolla hatchback. It was the worst car ever. I hated it the day I bought it, but I bought it because it was a good deal. And uh, drove it for like 12 years. And that, that simplicity allowed me to have the freedom to go and start a company and to work for a year and a half without getting a paycheck. It wasn't because I was wealthy or had parents' money. Um, none of that. It was just that we lived well below our means. And so if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, I would say that simplicity in your life is freedom. It literally is the difference between owning 50% of your company or 5% of your company. It's how well you're able to manage things on your own. So the other thing to ask yourself is really, what's your vision for a better world? We, we know some visionaries. Does anyone know what this is? What's that? No, not quite. Close, though. This is in California. It's an orange grove. So Walt Disney saw this. This is whatever 40 acres or 80 acres, I don't know, whatever, however big that is. Walt Disney saw this. And this was his vision for a better world. It was a place, a magical place, to make people happy. I sometimes call it the place that, the, that their vision is to take everybody's money that has a family. But uh, um, it is a happy place. I mean, there's a Tomorrowland, Adventureland, and all these little lands, and, and uh, 
his, his vision was, here's a place that families can go. It's magical. We're going to call it the magic kingdom. So he sees the orange grove. This is his vision. And he says, you know, it's kind of hard to get money. Financers, they don't really use dreams as collateral very well. And so it's tough. When you talk about the passion, this is why it's hard. Because nobody cares about, nobody else cares about your dream, right? And they definitely don't offer money, at, uh, you know, at using your dream as collateral. It doesn't, you have to do something hard. You have to build something on your own. So what makes an entrepreneur then? Because that's a kind of a, a unique sort of person that can put everything out on the line, including their name and reputation, their potential future, instead of just taking a, a, a job where they'd probably be successful and have a good career and make some money and you know, have a good life. So entrepreneurs are unique. They look at the same thing that a million other people have looked at, and they see something that's completely different, completely unique, and then they act on it. Usually it's things that the other millions haven't even taken any time to bother with at all. So a few, uh, few ideas about entrepreneurs. That you, you, you know you might be an entrepreneur if, at 7 a.m. on your way to work, you see a grown man riding a bike and wonder how he has time for that. If you cut your own hair. If you spend more time and energy looking for an easier way to accomplish something than you would have spent just doing the task outright. These are entrepreneurs here. You've gone for two years without pay from the company you own despite the fact that you really need to get paid. You risk permanent bladder damage because you won't take time to use the restroom. You get more exercise pacing and talking to yourself than any other form of activity. While at a concert or sporting event, you entertain yourself by estimating the evening's gross margin. Do any of these sound familiar? You might be an entrepreneur if any of these apply. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, how, how do we get the ball rolling? And I'm a technology guy. I love software. And, I love software companies, kind of a, uh, a, a creative background as well. And so I want to share with you some things that I've experienced very recently, having gotten back in and started working on creating a company. I put this as numero uno most important. And it is, what do you stand for? This is key. What do you stand for is your passion plus your vision plus your values. Walt Disney had a vision. He had a passion. Combine that with the values. And that's what keeps a company going. Now, I put this as step one because you can't rewind this. Once you get those first partners on board, your first funding partners, uh, you hire a few buddies, the horse is out of the gate, so to speak, and you can't call them back. But when you have the right kind of passion, vision, values, really, this is culture. When you have that right kind of culture, it's really powerful in a company. It allows you to do things that inspire people, that, that cause people to rally behind you. Think of some of the, the favorite brands that we know of, you know, whether it's Apple or Harley Davidson or any of the other brands that, that, that you think of as a successful brand. It's really not their ingredients that you're buying. It's, it's what they stand for. And to be a company that stands for something, you have to hire people that stand for the same thing that you do. And we definitely have that here in the Valley. We stand for some unique things, like being family friendly, making time for family. That's really tough for people in the, the Bay Area to swallow sometimes. And so you set this up front, because this is part of you. So what's going to keep you going? Then start simple. Who here's had any of the lean startup classes? Or Red Nail It and Then Scale It by Nathan Furr. Awesome book. Great guy. Great, uh, great concept about starting a company. I would recommend it to everybody. So the idea is that you start simple. You know, 
it, it used to be if you had an idea, what you'd want to do is go build it, right? Got a software idea, going to write a business plan, going to hire a bunch of people, then we're going to build it, then hopefully it's a success. And that just really hasn't been working very well. There's so many businesses that, that don't succeed. In fact, some studies say up to 95% of small businesses don't succeed. Or if you look at it from a fundraising standpoint, you know, of, of 11,500 businesses that got funding last year, only 50 of them will have an exit above $50 million. It's, they're just, there's a lot of startup, not a lot of growth. So what we want to do is start simple. You can build a bicycle out of cardboard to show that you've got an idea. You can make a car out of clay. It's a lot cheaper than going out and building a car to see if anybody wants it. Prototypes are your friend. So when I was thinking about what do I want to do next, I knew that I cared. There's this nugget that I cared about, which is the workplace. And I was just, I was just tired of people that don't like going to work, not of those people, of the fact that people don't like going to work, that it's this big part of our life and people aren't thrilled about their companies. And so doing a lot of research, talking to a lot of people, that really the nugget was when we are, when we're recognized for what we do, then we get emotionally engaged in what we're doing, which causes us to be more productive, which causes us to be more recognized for what we do, which causes us to be even more engaged. So there's this, there's this uh, um, spiral that's, that's a positive that we can aim for in companies. Okay, well, how can a technology guy make a, you know, how can a technology guy do something with that? So the next thing is this, like, your idea, like, what, you know, what could I do that would make a difference? And so for me, the, my, my vision was, well, I, I, I kind of see, like, money going through the org chart at the beginning of the month, and then going to everybody in the org chart, and when people do good things, like, they're able to give each other bonuses based on that. So this was kind of the concept here, you know. You, money trades places and the people that are doing good get recognized for it and and uh, um, you get to see who's who's noticing what's going on and who's doing it doing the good work and, and to me that kind of seemed like the very basic concept well then you gotta go talk to people and you gotta interview people and you gotta say well you know if something like this existed what, how does it address the pain that you've got as a company what are you struggling with so I did interviews with people and uh, to try and grasp what, what are the problems they're really trying to solve. And then you come back and you do more research. So you take some of that and build some surveys and try to understand what are, is that just one or two or ten people or are there a lot of people that see life the same way and do they care about these problems? And So I did some research with this and discovered that, uh, yeah, this is something that a lot of people seem to care about and uh, seemed to be focused on. I mean, it was the, uh, the in the top three goals of like 67% of the companies that I talked to. So then you come back and you make wireframes. Now you don't have to be a programmer to make wireframes. You can draw them on a sketch pad. You can draw them. I use a program called Azure that I like. And Azure is a wire, you can make fully functional, like clickable wireframes to walk people through. So you, you kind of throw some ideas out there in wireframes and, and see, hey, does this make sense? You know, would this, would this work for you? And then you got to work on the brand. Because at some point, your brand has to reflect who you are as a company. And I, I went through this with Motivasi, starting with the name. So there are kind of a lot of thoughts about how do you name a company? And you guys are all going to start companies. You're all, I can tell you're all entrepreneurs. So a couple of ideas about naming a company. There, there are really two schools of thought. One is, hey, let's name it after the, what it does, the feature. You know, this could have been like bonus o or something. But 
I like to ask, what are you really selling? What does somebody buy when they buy your product? Like when somebody buys that task, what are they buying? Are they buying task management? And of course, that, that brand is old. It's not going to change. It's, you know, 2001. So it is what it is. That brand says kind of a feature. But what's somebody really buying? They're buying intelligence, effectiveness. They're buying a better workplace. So how do you, how do you brand something to, to say that? Same thing with motivosity. I, I thought that uh, you know, what people are really buying is a motivated workforce. They're not buying bonus software. They're not buying you know, any other number of features that we may or may not include. What they're buying is a, an employee base that really cares about, that they're like anxious to come to work and they care about their workplace. And so went through a million re <laughs> iterations of the logo from, I don't know, you know, you'd sketch stuff out and Guys, there is no bad idea. And we just went through pages and pages and pages. And then this little guy showed up. This was like scribbled on the back of one of the pages, like almost as like the start of an idea, but it wasn't flushed out. And to me, that says it all, because it's, like it's like a heart. You know, if you turn it sideways, if you're a Gen Wire, that's a, a little love. It uh, kind of looks like a little fist bump. Anyway. I loved it. So, branded the company. And then you go make better wireframes that are getting a little closer to, that reflect your conversations with people, that they understand. And, and uh, so we went through some of this here and, and uh, tried to nail down what's most important to people and what are the features that matter and so forth. And then make high res prototypes. So, get a good designer and start making it look good. Because when you start to have people build it, if you do it on uh, the cheap like I did, we'll talk about that in a minute, you gotta know what it needs to look like. So we built this fully functional, but not functional, high-res prototype. It wasn't talking to a database. All the clicks, all the information was just totally static, but the application was functional, and then, um, I'm going to come back to this concept here in just a second. Then I went to a service called Odesk and hired some developers and tried to hire developers that cared about this concept, that have demonstrated excellence in their past lives and who were anxious to work on this, on this project. And so I've got these, these folks uh, working to make this thing a reality. And all that didn't re doesn't really take a lot of money. Actually, you don't have to go and raise millions of dollars to get to where you've got a functional prototype of a product that you can now actually have real customers test and see how it solves the problem, whether it does or it doesn't. And that's pretty close to where we are right now. So back to that previous slide. The customer's money is always best. And I broke a few rules here with this because if I was really following entrepreneurial rules, I would have gone out and pre-sold some of this stuff and tried to get some, some, some money in the company to self-fund it from customer money. Um, didn't need to do that on, on this one, but that's something that you can do. You can go out and say, hey, you know, does this solve your problem? Oh, how much would you pay for that? Oh. Let's talk. What if you paid me now and we delivered it in six months? <laughs> Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't work. But uh, the customer's money is the best money for you to raise. And sometimes here, in the, and I teach a funding class, and sometimes we look at entrepreneurs and they raise some money and we're like, yeah, good job, you raised money. In a lot of ways, sometimes I see that as a little bit of a failure. Like, oh, I'm sorry, you, ra you had to raise money. Um, why is that? There are good reasons to raise money, don't get me wrong, but the reason should be around, hey, it's working awesome now, but it's, we can take it big a lot faster if we raise money. If it's, hey, we're falling apart now, and we just need to raise money to enhance the product or whatever, so we still have a business, it's the wrong time to raise money. 
Then I use some awesome software to manage these developers. I use AtTask. And uh, I really couldn't do this without AtTask. It keeps us all organized, helps me know exactly what everybody's doing, what our priorities are, and how much we can get done, and when we're going to have everything done, if we're behind or ahead, and all that good stuff. So just a plug for AtTask. And then spending some time doing the branding and, and uh, uh, social and, and blogging. So I hired a corporate blogger right off the get-go because so many people care about this topic. They're thought leaders in the space. And we want to be part of that conversation. We want to have partners and relationships among the influencers in this industry because there are so many of them. And it's... Uh, uh, you know, it's a great way to just kind of partner up and bring a win-win out to the marketplace. So that's my little motivosity story in a nutshell, and my life story in a nutshell. And now we've got some time for questions, if you've got any. Question in the back. You know, that's a good question because I sure could have said, see ya. And I was sort of the three musketeer type, you know, all for one, one for all. Now, um, there are probably other ways to do that. It might have worked out a little better. But it is what it is. I felt like because I was on the clock and I expected people <coughs> to give it their all, and if I had an employee who was working on something, I just did what I would have expected somebody else to do. Yes? Good question. So the question was, did my wife ever have to work to help support me through this process? And the, the answer is no. So I'll tell you a little story. Early on, we first got married, and I really believe that it's very important for my wife to be there for my kids. And she believes the same thing. So we're simpatico on that level. And before we had kids, she had a job as professional voice recording, making 75 bucks an hour. It's a pretty good gig. It wasn't full time, but it was, you know, four hours a week or something. Still a pretty good gig. And she had our first child. And um, a few weeks later, she went in, did a recording session. She took him to daycare. He came home from daycare with RSV and almost died. And um, we decided at that point, you know, there just really isn't anything that's worth shirking that duty. It's like selling it for money. And for us, it just wasn't going to happen. So that was the last day she ever has worked for money. Other questions? So how did you take your company from those four first employees to where it is now, would you say, in like 80 countries and all that stuff? Yeah, so the question is how do we grow from four to where we are now, 350 employees? A little bit of smoke and mirrors, a lot of divine providence, and some luck and a little bit of craziness. I'll give you another example. We went and pitched to Federated Department Stores when there was four employees. And it was us against Computer Associates. And it was for a gig that was going to manage approximately over a billion and a half dollars in creative work every year. And so it was mission critical for them. They were going to have 3,500 people on it. And we went out there, we did the same you know, write code in the hotel room, blah, 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 that we had done before. But we pitched to this group of 18 vice presidents. And it was a two-day pitch for us. They basically took 450 questions and went point by point. Can you do this? Show me. Can you do this? Show me. So some questions we would put off and say, we'll show you tomorrow. We'd go home, you know, right in the code, and come back the next day and answer it. But what was, what was unique about this was that... Uh, they narrowed it down, and they selected us, and they said, we need to see your financials. <laughs> we, 
we had no, we had like $600 in the corporate bank account and four employees. And I knew that just wasn't going to go very well in a company where 3,500 people were going to use this software. So I told them no. Uh, I said, we don't, you know, we're private. We don't show our financials to anybody. So sorry, you're out of luck. And they came back and awarded us the contract and we got a check for $389,000. And there's a lot you can do with a check for $389,000, plus they, they paid us another, about another $150,000 to come out and consult with them on how to use this software. And so things like that happened in our history that were just, you know, some people would say it's a lucky break. We really had no business winning that contract, but we did. And it came at a time where we were basically up against the wall and there was no way forward. And all of a sudden this comes in. And several things like that happened along the way. And so uh, I attribute a lot of it to uh, Providence. I really do. Yes. Any last words before we uh, No, I enjoy being here today. Thanks.